Excellencies, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the CSTD session. This morning, I have the honor to moderate the high-level panel on ensuring safe water and sanitation for all, a solution through science, technology, and uh, innovation. This is uh, item 3B on the agenda of this 26th session of the Commission. It is also one of the two priority themes that were approved by the CSTD at its session last year. The objective of this high-level panel is to discuss national and international experiences and identify strategies to deploy and scale up science, technology, and innovation in ensuring safe water and sanitation for all. We have several high-level panelists with us today, and uh, they will seek to address the following questions. What examples of science, technology, and innovation solutions that work can be proposed for dissemination to help ensure safe water and sanitation for all? How can we scale up the implementation of good science, technology, and innovation solutions, including financing solutions, towards progress in achieving Sustainable Development Goal 6? What is the role of international cooperation in promoting the development and the use of STI solutions to ensure safe water and sanitation for all? Before we start with the, the panel, let me first invite Mr. Angel Gonzalez Sanz, head of the Technology Innovation and Knowledge Development Branch in the Division on Technology and Logistics to introduce the report of the Secretary General for this item. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chairperson. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to present the report of the Secretary General on ensuring safe water and sanitation for all, a solution through science, technology, and innovation. The Secretariat has prepared this report based on the inputs provided by 25 member states of the CSTD and 10 international organizations, as well as the discussions at the intersessional panel of the CSTD that was held in October 2022. The report examines the role and potential of science, technology, and innovation as key enablers of the achievement of SDG 6 on water and sanitation. Water is what makes our planet inhabitable, and it's central to almost every element of our prosperity as individuals and as societies. This connects SDG 6 to virtually every other sustainable development goal. A failure to work towards SDG 6 represents a risk to every other goal, from food security to gender equality, and from peace to climate change. Against this background, Alongside the evaluation of macro trends, the Secretary General's report provides analysis and examples of technological and innovative solutions that touch on three key aspects. The first is enhancing access to water, to safe water and sanitation. The second is contributing to integrated water resource management. And the third is translating STI into impact on the ground. Although progress has been made over the last two decades, still 2 billion people need access to safely managed drinking water services. Even worse, almost 3.5 billion people still lack access to safe sanitation services. Access to water and sanitation is a challenge across the developing world, where climate change and pressure on the water, food, energy nexus are aggravating the challenge of access to safe water and sanitation. But different countries have different priorities. In some, there is a need to increase water-related infrastructure or to find water resources due to water stress. Meanwhile, there are water resources available in other countries or regions, but there are challenges related to obsolete infrastructure assets, excessive water consumption, or contamination issues. Access to sanitation presents a more uniform picture and is significantly less context-dependent requiring establishing proper sanitation facilities and wastewater treatment. This can be costly, and there is a barrier to providing sanitation facilities in remote areas and, margin and among marginalized people where it is most needed. 
the report suggests that for technology and innovation to be implemented and widely accessible, they should always be adaptable, inexpensive, and build upon existing technologies. For instance, solar power could enhance the desalination and water delivery systems for the provision of clean water for underserved populations. At the same time, reinventing toilets with low water requirements and enable, enabling small-scale modular wastewater treatment plants will bring innovation to areas with limited sanitation and wastewater treatment facilities. On the second key aspect, the report found that the implementation of integrated water resource management continues to lag. This is deeply problematic in an age where climate change is increasing water scarcity and the frequency of extreme weather events. Demand for fresh water is estimated to exceed supply by 40% by 2030. That date was once the distant future, now it's only seven years away. Scarcity requires us to dramatically improve the effectiveness of integra integrated water resource management. Technology and innovative approaches can be pivotal in achieving SDG 6 with positive impact on SDGs 3, 5 and 9. Artificial intelligence, big data and Internet of Things technologies can enhance monitoring water and sanitation infrastructure and accelerate the achievement of SDG 6. Solutions that use these technologies, such as smart metering, have proven effective by providing real-time information and customized feedback. Meanwhile, better forecasting and early warning systems are crucial to preparing responses for the floods and droughts that have become more frequent due to climate change. Implementing technology-based early warning systems and predictive models, including some that rely on drone technologies or deeply integrated earth observation systems, enables early disaster threat prediction and improves preparedness in areas that may be particularly affected. Ladies and gentlemen, technology is never a solution in and of itself. This must always be kept in mind. Technological innovation must be implemented in tandem with policy, governance, social, and process innovation. Only under these conditions will STI solutions maximize their potential and help us achieve SDG 6. As this report highlights, the key to translating STI into impact on the ground is that those technologies and innovative solutions are responsive to people's genuine needs and accessible as well, because inaccessible technology is often no better than non-technology at all. Access can be broken down into availability, affordability, awareness, accessibility, and the ability for effective use. Practical approaches to implementing technological solutions must first address these and other more mundane and non-technological barriers. For instance, a solar-powered water pumping system is of little use if it is too expensive, if people are unaware of its existence, or if it must be operated by a trained individual where no training has been provided. To develop transformative STI policies for accelerating progress towards SDG 6, the report underlines several key actions and recommendations about how to use STI to accelerate progress towards achieving SDG 6 on water and sanitation. First, technological innovation is not enough. Where suitable technological solutions exist, the achievement of real and lasting change requires a wider spectrum of parallel non-technological innovation, as I said, in policy, governance, and other areas. For instance, policymakers must develop close partnerships with local actors in water and sanitation to build technological acceptance and nurture the relevant digital and practical capacities to engage innovative technological solutions. Second, countries should take affirmative action to design policies and projects with a focus on marginalized groups, in particular women, who often soldered the burden where access to water and sanitation is limited. Capacity building workshops and initiatives focus on empowering marginalized groups by promoting their inclusion in decision making and water management have regularly been successful. 
Finally, it is crucial to implement policies that support concrete solutions. Though advanced solutions have an important role, effective and affordable but seemingly low-tech solutions for water and sanitation are particularly significant as they are often more appropriate for reaching underserved populations. Developing countries often do not have the means to access and implement complex and costly technology to provide clean water and sanitation. In many cases, investment in low-cost, low-tech, decentralized solutions, for instance, waterless or low-water-use toilets are sim and simple pop, uh, solar pumping stations, can have larger, faster, and more sustainable impact than more complex infrastructure projects. Let me conclude by underlining, underlining that we must bring stakeholders from different sectors and backgrounds to find solutions collectively. Global partnerships are crucial to support access to STI and enhance knowledge sharing that fosters the scaling up of good practices domestically and internationally. 2023 is an important year for SDG 6, with the UN Water Conference concluded just last week. The Water Conference and the CSTD are both multilateral platforms that can help identify innovative ways to ensure safe water and sanitation for all, and highlight the importance of investing in science and technology for achieving SDG 6. I hope that the report of the Secretary General, combined with the presentations from our esteemed panelists, will provide a good background and insights for a fruitful discussion this morning. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I thank the Secretariat for this presentation, which put in context the discussion that we are having here today, uh, this morning. Uh, before we start with the panel, uh, I wish to remind participants that, as announced in the program, interpretation services for interventions by remote participants is limited to a cumulative total of 30 minutes per session. Once the 30 minutes is exceeded, interpretation will subsequently be provided only for in-person interventions. Let me now turn to our high-level panelists. I will ask that remote panelists to keep their intervention to a maximum of 15 minutes uh, for uh, the ones that are participating in person and 10 minutes for those participating remotely to ensure that interpretation is available to all. Having said that, I now have the pleasure to invite Her Excellency, Ms. Leah Buendia, under Secretary of the Minister of Science and Technology in the Philippines to take the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Excellencies, colleagues, uh, distinguished delegates, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for this opportunity on behalf of the Philippines to present to you our activities and experiences on uh, water and uh, leveraging science and technology. May I have my slides, please? Next slide. Please allow me to share with you some of the um, information about the Philippines. Next slide. The Philippines is an archipelagic country with 7,641 islands, which are divided into three main groups, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. 15,000 kilometer of coastline, the fifth and longest along in the world and the maritime zones from 86.3% of the Philippines' total territory. It has a diverse reef with 70% of the cor coral triangle and the world's 10th largest fishing catch. Next slide. The Philippines uh, is 14.5% or a total of 22.7 million families still have no access to safe water based on the Philippine Development Plan. Around 332 municipalities mostly located in the nation's poorest provinces and urban poor spaces are still considered waterless. Despite being surrounded by water, the source of potable water in different regions in the Philippines, especially in small islands or in geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas is a major concern. Several sources like uh, deep wells, streams and wells are contaminated and are unsafe for human consumption. 36% of the 221,000 poor households 
or about 79,000 households have no access to safe water. Residents from uh, geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas travel by boat for an hour to fetch water in neighboring communities. These challenges spill over different sectors in the society and may cause a chain reaction if not addressed. Next slide. In order to encourage harnessing STI to address these pressing issues, there must be a conducive ecosystem or environment to support such initiatives. The Philippines develops enabling policies and regulations. The National Innovation Agenda of 2032 of the Philippines, which encapsulates the country's 10-year vision, long-term goals, and strategies for improving governance on innovation, identified blue economy and water as one of the priority areas of the government. In 2004, the Philippine Clean uh, Water Act was enacted to protect the country's water resources, abate pollution from land-based sources, and improve water quality through the formulation of better water quality management. The Department of Science and Technology also spearheaded the development of the Harmonized National Agenda for the priorities in 2022 to 2028. Water also has been a recurring subject that transcends all sectors. Lastly, the updated Science and Technology Water Environment Roadmap, which sets the direction of the water sector, was aligned with the different national programs, such as the DOST's uh, Harmonized National Research and Development Agenda and the Philippine Development Plan to complement the SDG 2030 Agenda. Next slide, please. How does the Philippine harness science, technology, innovation for safe water and sanitation? The Department of Science and Technology provides opportunities for funding R&D, data and access to shared facilities, capacity building activities for the regions of the Philippines, and transfer of technologies. The DOST develops or supports the development of various innovations for safe water and sanitation. Next slide. DOST, through its remote sensing and data science project, or what we call DATOS, developed a GIS plug-in to train and implement AI models in extracting features from satellite imagery. The technology uses the DOST's high performance computing, which can further utilize, but which can further be utilized by the public from academic institutions as well as government agencies. This allows environmental monitoring and assessment. We partnered with Laguna Lake Development Authority and the Libmanan Water District to provide the necessary support and technology for resource managers and planners to be able to continue improving their operations using space assets and advanced image processing techniques. Next slide. The DOST utilizes data and geospatial technologies to support our initiatives in developing maps and monitoring and modeling systems for the rehabilitation of our lakes. We have what we call the may, may mappable project that will develop and deploy an integrated system for mapping and monitoring the water quality of Manila Bay and linked systems, including major tributary rivers using geospatial techno technologies and citizen science. Another is the eSmart project that aims to provide streamlined solutions or interventions for the rehabilitation of Manila Bay through the hydrodynamic and materials transport analysis of the integrated Manila Bay, Pasig River, Laguna Lake, and surrounding watershed systems using numerical model. Next slide, please. The Department of Science and Technology also has various wastewater treatment systems. For this, we feature the upgraded emergency disinfection system, a batch-type mobile ready-to-use water treatment facility that can treat raw water to address the problem of drinking water shortage during natural disasters, such as flooding, earthquakes, and typhoons. With the emergency disinfection system, waterborne waterborne illnesses can be prevented and chances of survival may increase. It has an integrated solar panel that provides a reliable and uninterruptible power supply that can be used in areas where calamities have disrupted or cut off electricity and water supplies. The Department of Science and Technology partners with the local government units and non-government organizations, such as the Good Neighbors International Philippines, to deploy these technologies to communities. Next slide. Another technology called ECOCEP technology was developed by Dr. Palencia from Adamson University and funded by DOST. It is an eco-friendly septic system enhanced 
with or organo minerals called vigormin that was initially meant for disaster areas but was also adopted for various industries and applica applications such as temporary shelters, households and condominiums, public establishments and resorts. This infographic shown on the screen was prepared by a regional office. This was one of the deployment activities wherein the technology was provided to various local government units in the Shargao Islands of the Philippines that is famous for surfing, cliff diving, and other water activities. The ECOCEP was founded uh, using the reduce, reducing odor and improving the quality of the septic water and the use of vigormin reduced biochemical oxygen demand and reduced suspended solids. Next slide. Vigormin, on the other hand, is a natural, odor-free, safe, and effective treatment of septic tank and water. It usually comes out in powder form to be dissolved in water, and it is now being used to treat water in different lakes in the Philippines and is ready commercially available in supermarkets and e-commerce platforms. Next slide. Currently, there are various ongoing water treatment systems project of the DOST wherein we use nanotechnology for some of this. A long existing application of nanotechnology was in ceramic water filters developed with antimicrobial nano coating for households. These are household and community based filters for metals in water and comes with a portable filtration membrane module for remote areas. Next slide. Another major program is our Science for Change program. It consists of four components, uh, the NICER and the Cradle as uh, two of them. Uh, under this uh, program, the DOST has deployed technologies that address water concerns in areas with high socioeconomic importance. Some of the water technologies deployed uh, in water R&D are enhanced forecasting model for complex water supply systems and the Mountain Engineering R&D Center the Philippine Groundwater Outlook, post-treatment of food processing wa wastewater effluent for nutrient removal and the evapotranspiration-based irrigation scheduler and calculator. So these are just some of the projects that we are um, pushing forward. With the Philippines, next slide, with the Philippines experience in applying SCI solutions to solve the issues in water, we would like to share our learnings, observations, and recommendations. First, the SCI solutions, especially technologies, do not usually fall under a one-size-fits-all solution or approach. Countries need to develop technologies and innovations that can address specific issues in communities. It would be beneficial if such technologies could be replicated redesigned and later on be adopted to solve certain challenges in different settings. Second, while the government plays a crucial role in achieving SDG 6 through initiating projects and programs that ensure access to safe water and sanitation, it is also essential to involve other actors in the society such as the private sector, the academe, the NGOs, and the civil society. Working together creates a bigger and more significant impact to the communities. Third, these STI solutions for safe water and sanitation provides multi-pronged solutions which can generate economic savings, mitigating pollutions, reduce diseases, thereby also protecting humans and communities. And fourth, the government shall also create through developing enabling policies and initiatives a synergistic ecosystem that is conducive for R&D institutions, startups, the academies, NGOs, and other players to harness STI to solve various issues in the society as an unavailability and lack of access to clean water. Next slide. International cooperation would be beneficial in achieving SDG 6 through these three major international cooperation roles. One, is to establish partnerships to implement joint initiatives that may address common water-related issues and create bigger impact, such as in countries of the same region and similar geographic characteristics. Sharing of resources, uh, technical know-how, and uh, technology transfer among partners. Through collaboration, the financing institutions may be connected with beneficiaries or co-implementers. And the third is exchange of information on lessons learned, best practices, 
implemented and challenges encountered would also be crucial in comprehensive assessments and policy making. That ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I would like to thank uh, Her Excellency uh, Buendia for uh, this uh, uh, very impressive work that is uh, uh, being developed by by the Philippines. Uh, it was an impressive an impressive presentation, and uh, what you underline is sort of important in the policy making, uh, the multi stakeholder approach, the importance of uh, international cooperation. Uh, it was very interesting. Thank you very much. I now have the pleasure to invite Mr. Enrique Cabrera, a professor of the Polytechnic University of Valencia, Spain, and vice president of International Water Association. You have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, colleagues. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today to talk a little bit about kind of how digital water can can help us bring water and sanitation for all. And I would like to start for for a fact that may be maybe a little simple for for some of you, and it is that water is heavy. And there we go. Uh, the basic provision of water service, what is defined as basic, implies delivering fifty kilos for a person each day. That means that a family of four needs to be delivered seventy three thousand kilos. And if we talk about a population of 500, that's 9,000 tons. And if we talk about a million people in a city, that's over 18 million tons per year. Uh, may, perhaps if I take it, if you think of it as a product, single product delivery to, to people, that means that a family would need 1.8 cargo containers per year. And then the others are just 225 cargo containers for 500 people and about 45 super container ships per year for a city of 1 million. If I have to translate this into something practical, it means that water is very local. The solutions for water are local because it's very heavy and it's difficult to take water from one place to another. You probably won't find any other product that is delivered in such large quantities to people in the world. And that's the difference with telecommunications, it is the difference with gas, is the difference with, with many other products. So the solutions that we present need to be designed, take into account local conditions, they need to be implemented locally. And of course, although they should follow international best practice, they should be designed at ad hoc. And I, I fully concur with the report in that, in that uh, respect. I'm going to speak a little bit about digital water. And, and what is digital water? Well, it's it's a it's a set of um, of systems, um, solutions, tools, software, and culture uh, that is going to help us. Uh, it's it's all about data gathering. Uh, data in the in the water industry is quite scarce. Assets are buried, and now digital can help us to obtain much more data and and far more reliable than it was before. It's all about visualizing and analyzing those data and the fact that we can now digest large amounts of data before in the water industry we've had lots of data but we didn't know very well what to do with it or at least some people didn't know to we've spoken today about artificial intelligence as well that can help to also take all those large amounts of data and help us in making better decisions and finally it's also about the engagement of the users who are the ones that are have to get uh, water and, and sanitation. And it's very important to have feedback and, and direct input from them. I'm going to, to bring some examples today in, in all those four aspects. First, I'm going to speak a little bit about data gathering. And we've already heard about satellite images, but uh, we can gather data from social media, from meteorological data. We can aggregate data from different sources, and we can use sensors to provide uh, real-time information. First example here, it's it's water point data exchange, which is uh, uh, aggregated data, which is charted uh, to provide information on, on basic access. This is a world map. 
if we go and zoom in, we, we see that every single sector has a little bit of integration and, and we know exactly in each area how many people have basic access, how many people do not have basic access. For me, the important bit about this besides the visualization is the large amount of data sources that were used integrated in that simple tool and i think that that's one of the key messages with digital it is we can make things easier to visualize we can make better decisions because it's simpler for us to digest the information this is another system and water which is an open system that help us to collect data and and once again uh, one of the main inputs today in this system is surveys so user surveys that can be used on site and those Surveys can be uploaded to the cloud and they are mixed with, with other data, like might be uh, population density data that's available out there or spreadsheets that can be filled in. The tool allows to clean and visualize the data. And once again, it becomes something uh, of a tool to make better decisions. There's another way to get a data, which is sensors. And, and um, I'm there's a very interesting example of uh, sensors, Internet of Things sensors um, uh, that are being used in refugee camps um, to basically monitor the water sources in those camps. So there is up-to-date information in real time. There was a, a pilot in Uganda where they were serving 500,000 refugees, 6,000 cubic meters of water, and the system has been used uh, as the basis of the payment for the water tracking operations, and it's, it's received an award. Uh, this is very important because it means that sensors are not just the thing that can be used in the, in the largest cities of the rich countries. They can be used in any location, and of course, they can provide uh, real-time information that can be very useful and then of course it is visualized i want to talk about a little bit more about that visualization of data and a first example i want to bring is augmented reality to assist in the operation of assets one of the problems with water assets is that they are buried and therefore we cannot see them and that's of course it's it's a problem especially for those people that do not know where they are uh, augmented reality can be used to display for instance the location of the pipes as you can see here in this picture and at the same time of knowing where the pipes are where the valves are we can get some uh, information on those assets so it's easier for operators to actually uh, work on them it's not only that, if you think about the facility that it's, for instance, a pumping facility, this is a large one, we could have a smaller pumping facility, but we can combine the use of sensors to actually know what is happening in real time. And so know which valves are open or closed, which pumps are on or off, what are the value of the different parameters. And when we were discussing before the ability of local people to operate facilities, these kind of tools actually help us in that goal. Another example uh, of uh, visualization is an example from, a, it, it's actually a full digital wa water platform. Some of these examples can be included in several categories, but I'm, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. The British Virgin Island had two storms in two weeks and destroyed a lot of the assets. And, and uh, what was done was it was used to, to take this digital platform to take some very basic data and, and build a model. And immediately what you get is a very visual representation of the assets georeferenced. Uh, that's a base to start with. But of course, uh, the idea of digital is making things easier. Some of the data from, from, uh, from the assets is now being sent to this platform via WhatsApp or Google Forms. So it doesn't need to be just the software. That was a, a quite lean solution. And of course, any of such system is just the good starting point to build upon and, for, for instance, introduce smart meters that was mentioned before. Uh, regarding artificial intelligence, of course, there are many things that, that can be done with it. I'm just going to give an example of another full platform uh, that basically uh, is it has some artificial intelligence built in. It's an, an, it's an open tool. It's a full network management platform, and it can create networks from very little information. The, the 
AI here comes because the platform is able to uh, assist operators in knowing what they need to do with the network, whether they need to open a valve or close a valve, what they need to do to enable to improve some of the of the system. It's already in use in Latin America in a large project with Inter-American Development Bank. And then I just give you another example of a decentralized solution. So how can we use artificial intelligence, for instance, with septic tanks? Well, uh, some um, algorithms can be used to optimize the collection routes for the for the tankers. So you, collecting times can be reduced 30, 40 percent and make it more efficient. If we add some sensors or a user app to those septic tanks, then it can be centralized to know which of those septic tanks require collection. So again, uh, a quite uh, a nice way to, to use digital. Regarding user engagement, of course, mobile apps can be used to improve services for the users and, and for instance, tell them where the location of safe water sources is, whether the quality of the water source is good or bad. They can actually input that information on a mobile app. They can report on quality issues. They can facilitate micropayments in some of the, um, the countries of the world where that is a, an obstacle for safe water and citation provision, and then can provide uh, the household information for to the users, for instance, when there is a, a smart meter, and tell them about their consumption, whether there's leaks, uh, and of course, the mention I made before about the septic tank. Uh, finally, I would like to speak a little bit about the role of international organizations, and, and we, we've heard about global alliances and, and how can we, can we actually move this agenda forward. I think that in the case of international organizations like the IWA, we can help with, with open dissemination of knowledge. This was mentioned yesterday. Uh, and I think it's very important that the scientific knowledge is in open format that can be accessed by all. Uh, there can be developed frameworks and standards that can be used to then tailor made the solutions at the local level. Uh, we can help with training and learning of other professionals. Of course, it's uh, supporting global professionals through a network. And uh, for me, that is what uh, I mentioned as turning global into local. So making sure that the best standards, the best technologies can be adapted to a local level. And of course, I would like to, to offer uh, the International Water Association, which is a, a global organization with 10,000 members over 130 countries. It's a water professional association. We strive to inspire change. And I cannot think of a better way to inspire change than talking to you today because you're the ones that can create the change. Thank you very much. Uh, muitas gracias, uh, Professor Cabrera. Um, so it was very ins inspiring, your presentation. Thank you so much. So turn global into local, uh, very good motto, absolutely. Uh, and um, again, uh, and under this commission, uh, it was very important to show the importance of digital technologies and the importance of the, 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 different, the different stakeholders and the role of each one. Uh, very good points, thank you so much. Uh, so let me now turn to our next panelist, Mr. Uh, Dulei Kaun, Deputy Director of Water Sanitation and Hygiene Program from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He will join us remotely. Mr. Kaun, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Just want to make sure uh, everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, want, I want to present today what uh, we're doing at the, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and the relevance to uh, to, to the work that you had commissioned on science and technology for development. I, I have a great appreciation for the report that was published. I think it's one of the a very influential reports in, in the sector and the areas where all of us are working to actually make non-sewer sanitation and water supply system part of the integral solution and how we can speed up uh, access to water, safe water and safely managed sanitation. Uh, system. Okay, so just in a nutshell, the Gates the Gate Foundation. Our our work really focused on trying to uh, to build and reduce inequality 
uh, in, in the world uh, where we think we can make a difference. We want to position ourselves more as a catalyst uh, to other partners. We are not the one in the field. We are not the government. We're not driving what most of the partners do on the field, but we try to position our work to be in a space where we can help innovate and deliver solutions that can go faster and help accelerate uh, our, our joint work. Uh, with regard to the water and sanitation uh, interventions, uh, most partners would ask me, uh, why is the Gates Foundation involved in this, uh, in this area and what exactly are you, are you doing? So back to what I just uh, mentioned, uh, it is our firm belief that existing sanitation systems are reaching their limit on you know, area that can be served, the type of population that can be served, the type of market that can be served, and we really need to live from with additional solutions so that we can extend services uh, to a much larger community at much larger, uh, much faster pace. So we see our role again in taking you know a position in areas where most of the partners are not investing. For example, in looking for new solution R and D, uh, is there alternative solution that we can deploy? Uh, or help partners deploy. So we invest a lot into additional R&D effort that can help complement what is already available in the market, either by increasing the performance of the existing system or helping to position technology that can actually help reach communities who don't have access to service today. Second role is reducing risk for industry players. So early R&D is very often too, too risky for many companies. So we see our role as one of the entity has a philanthropy organization uh, who can focus on, on that. And the third role that we can play is really help to stimulate adoption into the market when company can justify that product can, can, can go there. Okay. And how we do, we, we, we do this. We're not trying to push innovation in, in isolation. I think uh, this is a concept here, and I want to put this forward to the Commission to, to consider. When I look back, uh, what has actually uh, propelled the wastewater industry to a very big uh, 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 industry today, uh, I think we, we, we owe huge thanks to uh, innovators like Sir Edwin uh, Chadwick, uh, who back then in the early uh, century, 19th century, actually start putting up what we could call today uh, the first standard, the first regulation for how a sewer service should be organized. And because of that, we had a very brilliant, uh, very great industry today uh, servicing billions of people across the world. That is not enough and we need to find the next uh, complementary solution to, uh, to add on to, on to that. So we're taking the same, a similar approach to see if we can redefine uh, the performance system and service level agreement for on-site sanitation system. So if people don't have access to sewer system and would have to rely on on-site sanitation system, what would be the standards that we can actually all work against? So, and so we've worked with uh, several partners and, and around the world to actually put together uh, what we believe that standard reference should be. It's not, it's not enough. This is just standard that we all can actually drive the development of innovation, technology innovation, and, and put into the market the next uh, generation of solution. So an example would be the ISO standard 30500 that has been published in 2018. It's been adopted by several countries today, and South Africa has been one of the first countries to adopt it. I'm mentioning South Africa, because in the UN report that you just published, uh, you're calling for government to actually drive innovation uh, uh, across several areas of intervention uh, from academia to industry, to government financing organization. The countries like South Africa who are actually, I believe, among the leaders in the world uh, are doing that. I'm currently visiting Telangana in India today. And this is again, another government here who I believe can actually provide uh, substantial case studies for uh, to support what is in the in the in the report and in, in the way we, we we do this and i want to highlight here the different level of innovation that is needed across the innovation value chain so from r d to product into the market 
And yes, we have to work with academia in the beginning on leading industries who are really positioned as innovative uh, industries, prototyping companies. Uh, toward the end, the role of government and businesses to innovate on regulation policies, market uh, regulation uh, become very, very critical. I think all that is well uh, captured again in the in the, in the in the report. So from our perspective, uh, we have developed today more than 25 different types of technology, which I believe can support the current system, existing system, providing better quality system as services to communities, removing pathogen into the environment, and enhancing performance of existing system or deploying technologies uh, in areas where existing system cannot, uh, cannot be deployed. We are onboarding industries. We're calling for industry to actually come and, and take this solution uh, further into, in, into market. And we can transform today terms of these of these technologies, what is conceived as waste into valuable product. So the report mentioned, for example, the toilet consumed 30% of the drinkable water uh, at household level. So reinvented toilet or non-sewer sanitation solution that comply with the ISO standard I just mentioned earlier, would actually take the toilet off grid, completely off grid. Each of the toilet can produce their own water for flushing. So we don't need uh, to actually use precious resources into, uh, into the toilet. Solid can be processes to the level where it is completely safe to either put on the garden, put into the garbage without, uh, without no, no, no pathogen. And I think that should be the purpose of really safely managed sanitation service delivery uh, at scale. And there are technologies today to, to do that. Uh, we're trying to understand how to be very innovative in terms of service provision uh, business model so that this system can actually go to market much, much faster. Okay, these are example of system which are in the, in, in the pipeline. The picture in the middle will show you uh, a prototype that is similar size to any uh, appliance you may have today in your in your house and these are all available uh, today uh, for companies to actually try to bring it forward so when the report calls for innovators to actually uh, help accelerate the solution i believe there are many companies today not only the one that the gate foundation is but there are many companies today who have similar capability and similar solution uh, av available what i really want to understand is uh, with the commission here what type of partnership can be built to actually give those innovators much more visibility and a platform uh, to go faster into, in, into the market. So where, uh, where do we build those, those case studies? So I was mentioning for you South Africa, uh, Telangana here in, in India, there are many, uh, many other places where I think we can build uh, those, those examples uh, together. So it's, it's clear, you know, the solution invented 200 years ago actually helped uh, save a lot of life. Uh, sanitation system, sewer system has it is uh, conceived today has really helped increase uh, the life expectancy in many communities. The population is growing at a different rate. We need additional system to actually catch up with the service, uh, service delivery. I don't think we can continue pushing sewer for everywhere uh, that people people live, we've come to realize with the climate uh, uh, climate change, impact of climate change, availability and non-availability of water, they need to actually build resilience communities. Decentralized system becomes uh, becomes key, and there are solutions today which I believe uh, can be uh, can be accelerated to to that through so the effort we've we've been leading so far. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to, to share today. There are companies today with product available in, in the market. What those companies are not seeing is a prioritization to deploy this into the market. Cost is a concern, understanding of the system is a concern, the right policy to actually drive adoption is a concern. So there are areas I think as a community we can do uh, together to open quickly market opportunity and, and help government embrace uh, those, those innovations as, as well. So that's where my presentation uh, end today. So thank you.
Uh, thank you, Mr. Cohn, and to, thank you very much for keeping to the 10 minutes. Uh, in these uh, 10 minutes, uh, you raised the role of uh, philanthropy, the role of the commercial partners uh, on uh, good, very good business models uh, to recycle water, uh, and which continues to feed uh, something that I, I found very interesting, which is the toilet revolution. So very interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me now turn to our last panelist, Mr. Uh, Su Karit uh, Kutana Kulvong. Sorry if I my pronunciation is not the best one. Distinguished scholar in water resources management uh, from uh, Shulalong Korn University in Thailand. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank, first of all, I would like to thank uh, for the, uh, the meeting to invite me to give a talk on the, about the STI solution for dam irrigation and community management to ensure with safe water and sanitation for all uh, Thailand case study. Yeah? So even though uh, water supply in the village level in Thailand reached about 93% with the suitably uh, sanitation facility coverage in 2020, Thailand still has issue of drought, floods, and water productivity, water quality in SDG 6. With the high demand of the urban and industrial sector and recent climate fluctuation, water management needs more precise and quick response to prepare for emergency preparedness and long-term water resource planning to cope with such environmental change, especially in the central plain of Thailand, which is about 2 million hectares, which includes Bangkok, where most of the socio-economic activities exist. As a background, uh, our last five years, we have a national 20-year master plan. And this is the first time that we can have the long-term uh, national water plan in many aspects. And Water Resources Act was also uh, enacted in the last six years, which uh, combined with about 40 organizations together in one unit. So uh, the research uh, master plan has been spec, and water is one issue of the, uh, the country uh, special uh, spearhead issue that to be researched. And I'm, I'm the one of the chair of that research program. This next. Week. So the idea of the water supply in the, in Thailand, especially in the central plan, uh, up, up to now, uh, normally the, they are fragmented uh, agencies. Uh, rainfall data is uh, covered by the metrology department. Rainfall is uh, uh, irrigation by uh, uh, Royal Irrigation Department. Then demand side is uh, bought from the satellite agency. So there are three different departments uh, combined together. But now what we want to know is how we can uh, upgrade the uh, resource operation, which are now in the central plain we rely in about 30% of the water bottom of the dam, especially in dry season. So we want to uh, upgrade uh, up the efficiency about 20% so that in the dry season we can have more water. What we can do? So there are needs to predict the, the rainfall data correct and predict it. Now we have to uh, observe and predict the runoff data. We have to predict the water demand, especially in the irrigation in advance. So we said the last, the first year is 14 days, and now we are doing two months ahead. So this uh, combined STI module, what is satellite on soil moisture, rainfall forecast, monitoring water levels and storage, including groundwater. Uh, potential and include a new AI technology together, bring a new mode of water infrastructure, including dam, gates, and pumps control based on the future weather scenarios in the basin level. Nobudu simulates proof to lessen drought and floods phenomena and can, can save more water storage in the rainy season for in the average 900 million cubic meter or equivalent to the medium scale of dam, new dam, be you, to be used in the next dry season which ensure more water supply for both domestic agriculture and environmental uses in the study area. Next, please. So this is uh, another groundwater model in the area. So we can, uh, from the model, we can estimate, uh, assess the potential and also groundwater uh, yield in the area where the water move and how the farmer are pumping water and should, where, where should be the uh, limit of the water pumping in, the, in this zone. Next one, please. So from the, our simulation from the last uh, 20, uh, 20 years, we can find that with the new uh, informed the STI module, 
can save the water about 1,200 million cubic meter or 800, in, so in average about 900 million uh, cubic meter per year to save so that this water can be uh, managed in the next dry season. So this is run under 2000 to 2020 data and cloud water potential also is assessed and used as a backup resource in the dry season. Next slide, please. So uh, that is an investment base, but the real user is in the irrigation project. So we have another uh, one irrigation project. So we are have to introduce the automated water and the cloud soil moisture sensor and water level in the main canal so that we can catch up with the water delivery to the farmers. In the irrigation project level, the automation system with cloud water level and soil moisture sensor were installed in the irrigation. And there is about 48,000 hectares with data linked with the above dam operation. The data water level in the canal, soil moisture, cloud water level in the paddy field were monitoring and transferred to the irrigation staff and water use group. Uh, water use group, they use a line mobile to convey the message among the member. This uh, will be used for water and crop planning among the irrigation and the farmer groups on the monitoring data. The, this will help to reduce water conversion loss in the irrigation project and ensure that water, the irrigation water, both quantity and timing for the farmers to gain more confidence to plan for crop cultivation of both paddy and other cash crops, which increase farmer revenue and water productivity from the irrigation project simultaneously via data driven dam operation optimization and water sharing among users. So this is uh, uh, the data that uh, from our module in the irrigation project, we can save the water loss about 16% to 25% depend on the year, uh, the amount of the dam storage. Next slide, please. So uh, this uh, in the farm, in the field area, we have to uh, train, uh, discuss with the farmer groups, water user group, how they plan the cultivation, how they plan about the water uh, sharing amongst the group. So there, are, this is a big area, about uh, 48,000 hectares. So we divide to about 33 water use group. So they have to discuss how to share between the upstream, midstream and downstream, so that the water convergence will be minimized and they can get the water quota at the certain quantity and timing. So they, we have created a community water plan. We have the more distributed water sharing, we can save time to monitoring the water because of the water level monitoring. More surface area can be expanded from the water left and we reduce water convergence, increase water productivity with the same amount of irrigation water. They can expand more irrigation area. Next slide, please. So the farmer, instead of doing only paddy because of limited water sources, now they, are, they know that the amount of water and timing water, they turn to be the alternative agriculture activation. So instead of doing all the rice only, now they spare some spaces to uh, uh, set some other uh, plant like uh, herbs or lime or other sources so that they can have uh, more revenue instead of waiting for water for petty. So they establish the social enterprise after they have feel secure and confident water that they can get and establish other sources and make the marketing for other sources and increase the revenue. So we can see that in the land plantation in the area, they can increase revenue about 933 USD per acre. If they do the herb plantation, they can add about 1,000 USD per acre. And this is another revenue from the paddy that they can get because of the new SCI module implemented. Next, please. So the pilot stage mode of SCI module were tested for and run for two years in the real operation. The scheme will be used as a schooling to train irrigation staff and water use school group in other area to adapt the way of the cultivation and water use for uh, next two years. Under the National Water Resource Master Plan 2018 and 2037, more new technology in water infrastructure management will be introduced based on the urgency and readiness of the area to counter with new water demand, fluctuating climate, and to reach SDG 6. The possibility of new financing mechanism, including PPP, 
we will also explore in the master plan to expand this kind of a scheme. The action research granted by TSI and NRCT, Superhead Research Program on Water Management, could reduce the new view and modes of IWM based on the SCI to ensure more safe water and sanitation. The training and preparedness of irrigation staff, water user group to understand and be ready to adapt to the new mode are basically essential for successful implementation. The case study can be learned and shared and used to other countries under international promotion and cooperations on common information infrastructure need in the international level. Thank you very much for my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tanaku Vong. Well, uh, I insist in saying your name, so uh, I hope it's more or less uh, uh, correct. Uh, but thank you very much for presenting the Thailand uh, study case uh, in water resource uh, management, which was very interesting. So let me now turn to our discussant, uh, Ms. Sophia Ewer, member of the Gender Advisory Board of the CSTD, who will join us remotely. Ms. Ewer, you have five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, and good morning, and thank you for uh, giving me time to speak on behalf of the Gender Advisory Board. I'll, uh, we'd just like to start by saying that we emphasize that water, even though over decades of work on this, water remains a critical gender issue in development, and we support the statement that access to clean water is a rights issue. In 2023, the United Nations reports that at the current rate of progress, 1.6 people will, say, will lack uh, drinking water, 2.8 billion people will lack, uh, will lack sanitation, and 1.9 billion people will lack basic hand hygiene facilities in 20 2030. So this is really critical. Access to sanitation facilities continues to be essential for women, for health diseases, for health concerns, transmission of diseases, and cultural issues. Uh, we need gender-specific approaches in sanitation for privacy, uh, because the lack of privacy and security affects things like women's att uh, girls' attendance in school and women's ability to uh, travel outside of the home. Women's other water-related activities include collecting drinking water, family health issues, subsistence farming, irrigation, and watering of livestock. They are involved in agricultural labor we know as well as off-farm economic activities, and both of these require consistent and reliable and affordable water access and sustainable water management. Uh, this is especially true uh, under climate change as drought, flooding and variable, variable rainfall are increasing. Um, this may cause them to have to travel longer distances to collect water. Uh, it may cause them to spend more time irrigating fields, uh, there's more, there may be more of a problem with evaporation of water uh, so that there's water scarcity, longer dry, scales, longer dry spells and other implications for household and agricultural water. Women and girls access and management of water is also a technology issue. Women undertake a range of far diversified farming and household tax which are not recognized and therefore not supported with technology. So this work continues to be labor intensive. For example, women often use manual technologies to irrigate. In other words, they're carrying buckets and watering cans out to the fields for irrigation, while men tend to use the mechanical technologies such as mechanized pumps. So this is really important as well, increasingly important. And we know science, technology, and innovation can contribute to overcoming these challenges by improving distribution and delivery of safe water and sanitation, providing integrated water resource management, harnessing technologies, and addressing inequalities in the sector, notably in relation to women's participation. Involving women in these solutions for water and sanitation management is key to success and sustainable development. We need them, for example, in solutions that consider their needs in developing and applying technologies and including them in budgeting and management decisions. Uh, we know that women's participation in resource management groups increases the efficiency of these groups and contributes to preservation of natural resources. We know they're a significant part of stakeholders involved in everyday water use, but they make up 
less than 18% of the paid workforce in water utilities. Uh, it, uh, earlier, a UNDP study showed that involving both women and men in water management at the local level can increase project effectiveness and improves the likelihood of sus sustainability. This was in a study of 44 water projects in Asia and Africa. So there are different models to address these gaps. Solar powered irrigation is a great model for uh, providing access to water that is, does not rely on manual labor um, and that can increase the production of produce so that it's available year round. Uh, so that women and men, women and girls can reallocate their time to education and economic activities, nutrition increases, and women themselves gain status and confidence because they're the managers of a new technology that has brought a lot of uh, benefits to their communities. It can also be an entrepreneurial opportunity. Another option for women is to make sure that um, climate and weather information is targeted to women and girls' interests and their activities. Um, data forecasts and agricultural um, information that are targeted to women's agriculture and livestock activities can be made accessible in a range of, of uh, channels, as we call them, either mobile phones, television, or radio, and some groups such as the CGIR are looking at this approach. So we'd like to highlight that a great deal of progress is being made in the application of frontier and digital technologies for water management, irrigation, and sanitation. However, very few of these technologies or apps target use women users or adequately integrate user-centered design. This is a glaring gap that needs to be addressed. We also know that sex disaggregated data on water is very, very scarce, and that also is a gap that needs to be rectified. The members of the Gender Advisory Board would like to volunteer to contribute to this debate and these uh, discussion of these issues and share our and our network's experiences to expand the women and water issue beyond sanitation to encompass water for agriculture and food security, water in urban areas, STI-based water solutions for development, and expanding women's contributions to technology and innovation for sustainable development. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Heuer, uh, for your remarks and uh, looking forward to, to continue to work uh, with you uh, to, to surpass the, the, the gender gap that you uh, 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 rightly outlined. The floor is now open for the interactive discussion. Please keep your intervention short and no more than three to five minutes. Also, please be reminded that as soon as we exceed the 30 minutes of remote interventions, interpretation for remote interventions will no longer be provided. So I have here a list uh, for the interventions and I will start with Mr. Nichidi, Nichidzi uh, Molawa. Deputy Permanent Secretary from the Ministry of Lands and Water Affairs from the Botswana. Please, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. Am I audible? Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson of this session and, your, and the panelists for the good deliberations this morning. Um, I'm greatly humbled and honored to be part of these important deliberations this week. Uh, it is undeniable that water and good sanitation plays a crucial role in all aspects of life. That is why every other sustainable development goal relies in some way or the other uh, on water for, for, for all others to, to, to actually be achieved. Uh, the role of science and technology and innovation in ensuring safe and sustainable water uh, and sanitation therefore comes at a timely point in addressing some of these uh, critical issues of water related challenges. And uh, Botswana as an arid country uh, with a vast population spread all over the place, uh, uh, is, is one of those that are persistently challenged with water shortages, uh, which uh, with the dry climate, which is worsened by an ever-increasing demand. 
uh, we experience uh, hydrological drought, which, which have become severe and more frequent over the years, resulting in water supply challenges that threaten uh, and overwhelms our uh, insufficient resources. Furthermore, uh, our sparse population create a major engineering and financial challenge pertaining to the water infrastructure development. In some cases, there's either little or no water near the, the settlement, thus creating a need to reticulate, clean, store, and transfer water from source at great expense. Uh, Botswana have made significant strides towards uh, achieving or attaining the SDG targets with an overall of 92% of the population uh, uh, using uh, basic drinking water services. 83% of urban population use safely managed drinking water services and other 15 uh, using basic services compared to 70% of rural population whose use of basic services and 15% using only limited services. Uh, furthermore, uh, our sanitation is one of those that is uh, lagging slightly behind because uh, as a government, we have deliberately prioritized supplying of water ahead of uh, supplying of sanitation infrastructure. Therefore, you will see that we are now sitting at 77% of population with basic access to sanitation services. But as we go forward, the plan is to focus more into sanitation so that it can catch up. And this is something that our president is, is pushing very hard to ensure that there's that shift towards uh, uh, focusing into addressing the sanitation needs. Uh, Botswana was not spared by the impacts of COVID-19, one of which being shortage of chemicals required in cleaning and disinfecting water. Therefore, our water utilities cooperation had to be very innovative to ensure that during this difficult time, the economy continues to get clean water. And one way of innovating was to actually carry out some research. And that research resulted in us discovering that chlorine dioxide, it's a chemical that could actually substitute chlorine. And that actually resulted in the discovery that even the chlorine dioxide was actually more cost effective and, uh, uh, and giving high efficacy levels over a longer distance along the pipelines in terms of keeping the water disinfected. Therefore, since, since the, the end of the COVID uh, era, we've gradually implemented this technology, put in place new plants to ensure that at source, we generate the chlorine dioxide by mixing the required chemicals so that we can produce the, the required disinfectant so that uh, the water can remain clean. And this has gradually been rolled across the whole country. Uh, and the advantage of this is that over chlorine is that chlorine requires to be boosted over time along the pipelines. But this you could go for 100 kilometers without necessarily having to, to boost it, which we found it to be very applicable to our particular uh, environment. Uh, the other area that we have putting a lot of energy in is the use of uh, technology. This technology, we are talking of Internet of Things where uh, the corporation have invested significantly in ensuring that uh, we move towards the uh, digital and the smart uh, way of doing things. And we have actually piloted smart meters and we are at the end of the pilot phase now. We are now in the process of uh, uh, procuring a supplier to be able to supply the smart meters across the country as a service. Uh, we are using it as a service rather than procuring it upfront, uh, partly to share the innovation risks, because these smart meters and water are not as popular as the smart meters that we found in electricity. And for us, it's a new thing. So we need to, we need to ensure that whoever that comes on board is going to be a partner uh, as opposed to a supplier who will supply you and leave. And uh, also it's to ensure that we mitigate the cost associated with obsolescence in technology, 
because as a public uh, utility or a public in general to keep up with technology uh, requires quite a, a bit of expense while for developers and for private uh, sector they could adapt on this fairly rapid uh, with regards to customer interfacing because running a water utility requires that uh, customers are happy at the end of the day if the customers are not happy uh, you are as good as not doing your job we have put in place self-service platforms such as use of the internet uh, the use of uh, an, a mobile app to ensure that customers can manage their utility accounts and also the apps provides that uh, opportunity for customers to actually report uh, water leakages to water shortages wherever they are and i have to say that uh, with these new inventions and new app technology there is a requirement for intensive engagement to ensure that uh, the uptake of this is quite high this basically have to to push people away from coming to buildings or to utilities office to get a, a service uh, Botswana National Water Conservation and Demand Management Strategy also promotes the, the water efficiency and the exploration of what alternative water sources, such as gray water recycling, rainwater harvesting, storm water collection, saline water, and wastewater utilization, thus reducing pressure on fresh water sources. On that, on that note, uh, we are carrying out a research. As, a, as an initiative for climate change adaptation on managed aquifer recharge. We have recently completed the feasibility studies. We have found that it's quite feasible. Uh, this is a project that we view to be quite strategic in the sense that uh, we will be able to uh, store the water underground and at the same time avoid the high loss of evaporation which is in excess of 2,000 millimeters per annum. Therefore, the water that we store in dams, we basically lose most of it. With that, Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, very much um, for sharing what is going on in Botswana. Very encouraging. Thank you so much. Uh, now I give the floor to Mr. Scott Sellers, Senior uh, Policy Ad Advisor, uh, in the United States Department of State. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the floor. Good morning, distinguished delegates, colleagues. Uh, I also want to thank the panelists for their insightful presentations today. Uh, the United States will work with member states to un overcome today's challenges and tomorrow's needs by working with members of this commission connected by shared values and shared commitment to, the, to achieve the 2030 Agenda. I found Professor Cabrera's uh, slides putting uh, in context the number of people, the size of water, and the weight of water as really um, kind of important for us to consider when we look at the global trends in population growth, urbanization, environmental degradation, deforestation, climate change, and all how all these pose uh, great challenges to water security around the world. Uh, tackling these challenges requires accelerating efforts to achieve SDG 6. Uh, last year, uh, the White House Action Plan on Global Water Security was released on June 1st of 2022, and it demonstrates the United States' commitment and leadership on global water security. This plan, as well as the 2022 U.S. Global Water Strategy, is working to strengthen global, national, and local systems in a way that meets the needs of marginalized and underserved populations. The United States is working with partners to strengthen sector governance, financing, institutions, and markets, increasing equitable access to safe, sustainable, and climate resilient water and sanitation services, and the adoption of key hygiene behaviors. USAID, our development agency, has set a five-year goal to directly ensure that by 2027, 22 million people have access to water services and 22 million people have access to sanitation services, half of whom will be people who have never had these services. 
Multilaterally, the United States also engages in technical collaboration with the UN Children's Fund, the Water Sanitation and Hygiene Program. In addition, key programs include USAID's Water Security and Sanitation Programs, the Development Finance Corporation's mobilization of private capital to promote access to potable water, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations Strategy. Through investments in global water security, including access to safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene, the United States, through USAID, has mobilized more than $450 million. And since 2008, USAID has reached 65 million people with access to safe drinking water and 50 million people with access to improved sanitation, half of whom were women. Finally, we must not ignore the urgency of action, and the United States wants to deeply engage on this topic with this commission. And we're committed to focusing on reversing the negative trends by working together and calling for the immediate acceleration of SDG implementation using STI breakthroughs that steer towards transformative and systematic change while also addressing the gaps and challenges we face together. With that, thank you, Chair, uh, for the time. I yield the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Scott. So and now I will give the floor to Latvia. Mr. Ambassador, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I am glad that one of the two priority of them at the CSTD session is related to clean water and sanitation for all. That's our high priority for Latvian governments. Moreover, it's that our discussion follows right after the historic UN 2023 water, World Water Conference in New York. The importance of topics is underlined by the fact that the access to water and sanitation, san, uh, san, sanitation basic human rights Unfortunately, one of four people around the world are still denied these rights as they lack access to safe drinking water. It's our common responsibility to work together, including within the CSTD, to accelerate progress towards achievement of CS uh, SDG 6 and the whole 2030 agenda. I'd like to use this opportunity to provide a few examples of how Latvia is addressing the challenge of our water governance and providing clean water to all. Latvia is blessed to the among the countries with fresh water supplies exceeding current demands. However, we live by the Baltic Sea, which is among the most popular, uh, polluted seas in the world. We recognize our responsibility to do our, our best to limit its further pollution and work for solution to make it clean. Therefore, to achieve this goal, Latvian government has introduced mission C2030 that our, the overreaching our goal of the mission is create a systematic frame, framework to ensure improvement of the water quality in the Baltic Sea. In order to improve, implement the mission, government stimulates innovation, commercialization of science and cooperation between all relevant stakeholders at local, national, regional, and international level. Latvia currently holds the rotating two-year Baltic Maritime Environment Protection Commission presidency and implementation of update Baltic Sea action plan for the healthy, resilient Baltic Sea ecosystem. It's key priority for us. Source to sea approach is crucial for that. It's our, it's our ambition in cooperation with other countries around the Baltic Sea to create a digital twin of Baltic Seas to monitor and reduce its pollution. In order to deliver the mission C2030, our research institutions are actively engaged in developing technologies to improve water management system and to make it more accessible for everyone. In Latvia, the leader in the, this area is Tech, Latvia Riga Technical University. Recently, the university has created a digital twin for River Ogre that can focus floods 24 hours in advance. This solution already brings <clears throat> benefits to 
local community. In perspective, we have to integrate the solution in national flood risk information system. The Technical University has also developed a mobile pipe flushing device at the moment of the water pipeline maintenance work allows in cost efficient way to gather relevant data for the future analyze. At that moment, the university is working on ultra thin membranes for the use of water filtration that will reduce energy consumption and make the water processing more affordable for the developing countries. While working on delivering clean water for all, we also keep in mind <clears throat> our common climate goals in order to reduce carbon footprint of wastewater management. Latvian wastewater management companies are installing solar power plants that make op uh, operations greener and more cost efficient. Dear colleagues, one of the key enablers for the implementation of STI solution in water treatment and sanitation system is quality education. Therefore, Latvia is actively participation, participant in various European Union educational and uh, practical training projects. Latvia is committed to share knowledge and technology with our partner countries. Latvian clean technology cluster, CleanTech Latvia, has implemented capacity building projects in area of water supply as verge in Central Asian countries. Through our work, we are contributing to the Team Europe Initiative on Water, Energy, Climate Change in Central Asia. Latvia is looking forward to expand this experience and cooperation in this area with two African region as well. Latvia stands ready to share our experience with other countries to address this global water challenge and drive forward to the work of SDG 6. Dear colleagues, last but not least, I'd like to use this opportunity to inform you that tomorrow at 8.30 in this very room, Latvia will organize a panel discussion on protecting information integrity in the age of artificial intelligence. It will be my pleasure to welcome you at the discussion tomorrow. Coffee and croissants will be served. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Ambassador. And uh, so keep in mind tomorrow at, at 8.30, uh, the side event to be held in this room. So uh, now I give the floor to Egypt. Where is Egypt? Thank you, Madam Chair. Are you? <laughs> Please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Egypt thanks the Commission on Science and Technology for Development for presenting the report of the Secretary General and for the very interesting panel, which highlights the role of science, technology, and innovation in the global achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 6 and overcoming persistent challenges in this regard. As the report rightfully indicates, the human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation derive from the right to an adequate standard of living and inextricably related to the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, as well as the right to life and human dignity has been internationally recognized since 2010 in various international instruments. However, billions of people continue to lack access to safe drinking water and sanitation in their homes, schools, health facilities, and workplaces with devastating consequences for human rights and the health and well-being of people and communities. The world is also facing a global water crisis with grave risks confronting fresh water, the aquatic environment, and the people that depend on them. Moreover, the latest IPCC reports have indicated that most of climate change is manifested through water. The increase in frequency and intensity of water-related climate hazards, including water scarcity, floods, and droughts, affect the lives of billions of people worldwide and threaten food security, water security, livelihoods, and ecosystems, as well as the achievement of sustainable development goals. The impacts of this global water crisis, including water pollution, water scarcity, and water-related disasters, gravely threaten the enjoyment of many human rights, including inter alia, the right to work, right to adequate food, and the right to water and sanitation. The risks for persons already facing vulnerable situations, as their report highlights, are particularly acute. This multifaceted challenge to the enjoyment of the human rights to water and sanitation, with its intricate link to the full enjoyment of all human rights, needs to be addressed in a comprehensive manner 
that breaks the silos of water, climate, and human rights, and brings together member states, the UN system, and other stakeholders to help improve access to water for human rights, peace, climate resilience, and for life. It also highlights the urgent need for more innovative solutions based on science and technology for the acceleration of the achievement of SDG 6 and the enhanced focus on implementation through the embedding and upscaling of such solutions. Against this backdrop and stemming from Egypt's belief in the importance of science, technology and innovation for securing sustainable solutions, Egypt, together with the WMO, has launched the Action on Water Adaptation and Resilience Initiative, AWARE, during COP27, based on the premise that achieving SDG 6 is critical to climate change adaptation and mitigation, and with the aim of breaking the silence between water, climate change, disaster risk reduction, and sustainable development communities. The initiative bridges the gap between science and policy and addresses issues of water availability, supply and quality, as well as safe drinking water and sanitation, with work streams implemented across the aspects of finance, technology, data and information, and capacity building. Reminding us that SDG 6 is not only about safe drinking water and sanitation, it is much broader than that. Since its launch, the initiative has received increasing support from member states and organizations expressing interest for support and implementation, and has been presented as one of the main game changers in the UN 2023 Water Conference on the linkage between water and climate, and our solid contribution to the water action agenda and the implementation of SDG 6. We welcome ongoing international efforts in accelerating the implementation of SDG 6 and other water-related goals and targets. We believe that the existing and future challenges in the field of water require innovative and transformative ideas and a beyond-business-as-usual approach. In this regard, three areas merit particular attention. First, we must adopt a holistic approach to the human rights impacted by water. We need to address how water impacts all human rights, such as the right to food, health, adequate standard of living, and decent livelihoods. Improving water quality, reducing pollution, and addressing water scarcity are key to fulfilling a range of human rights. Second, we need actions based on science, data, and evidence moving forward. Water-related data and technology are central to cooperation, peace, and prosperity. Evidence-based solutions, such as to promote early warning and early action and integrate the water climate and disaster risk reduction, agendas like the COP27's Presidency Initiative on Action Water Adaptation Resilience need to be brought to the forefront. Third, we must remain inclusive bringing together all stakeholders and building synergies with other global processes. We must continue the comprehensive dialogue on human rights to water and sanitation, linking it with climate, sustainable development goals, and the overall human rights processes with a view to overcoming the fragmentation of the water agenda and develop targeted actions. I thank you. Thank you very much, Egypt. Now I'll give the, the floor to the state of Palestine. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, Moderator, Your Excellencies, colleagues, distinguished delegates and participants, good morning. Many thanks to the panel for their interventions and thanks to UNCTAD Secretariat for the support to this important CSTD session. We take note of all the findings and challenges presented this morning. The State of Palestine would like to share with you our experience and situation and addressing some solutions and challenges. The Palestinian government water strategy with the vision according to which the aims is to reach a sustainable and integrated water resources that can achieve the basic needs of the state of Palestine. The consequent mission is to make the, the Palestinian Water Authority a public institution that strives to manage, develop and protect the water resources and its infrastructure in a just, integrated and sustainable manner in order to provide water that is suitable for different purposes, which, she, which guarantees the protection of the environment and achieve the, the objectives of the development of Palestinian society and the SDG 6. Now, Madam Moderator, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, starting by some positive feedback from the occupied Palestinian territory, and despite the Israeli foreign military occupation of the Palestinian territory, we can mention the several successful water and sanitation projects implemented in Palestine. Under the guidance of the Palestinian president and the government and the leadership of the Palestinian Water Authority and the support of the international community that we are thankful and grateful. Some of these projects like Bethlehem, 
projects funded by the Agence Française de Développement France and Netherlands, Jinin Water Management Project funded by Japan, North Gaza Emergency Sewage Project funded by the EU, France, Belgium, Sweden, and the World Bank, Wastewater Treatment Plant in Hebron, Al Khalil, funded by the EU and France and the World Bank, Seawater Desalination Project in the occupied Gaza Strip by Japan. Madam Chair, Access to clean water in the developing countries remains fragile due of lack of adequate infrastructure, limited water resources, climate change, drought, and foreign occupation of territories too, like in my region in the Middle East and especially in the occupied Palestinian territory. We cannot avoid addressing conflict, wars, and foreign occupation environment and situations. Negative impact on access to water and development and developing technologies for distribution and management of water resources. This is a big challenge to indigenous people, access to water and sanitation, and sometimes access to water is impossible. As all of you knew, soon after Israel occupied, occupied the West Bank, including Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip in June 1967, the Israeli occupation military authorities consolidated complete power over all water resources and water-related infrastructure in the occupied Palestinian territory and in the, Syria, the Syrian Arab Golan and South Lebanon. The Israeli military occupation order number 158 of November 1967, controlling water sources and data collection related to water distribution in parts of Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon. Madam moderator, other challenges faced by Palestine is pollution in water sources due of settlements, intensive agriculture and, and agro-industrial activities using chemical substances and fertilizers and waste water, this situation should be addressed and solutions must be updated. The agriculture production in the both sides, Israeli and Palestinian territories should be revised, revised. The use of data and science and technology exchanges is essential to resolve this issue. Another challenge, in the OPT and the Gaza Strip, the rising seawater makes 90% of the Gaza Strip water unfit to drink. Here, here, we thank Japan for their valuable support by providing new technologies and innovation methods used by the Japan Desalination Station in the occupied Gaza Strip and Japan's several projects in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, strengthening the capacity of water service management. However, Nearly 10% of Palestinian communities in the West Bank have no access to piped portable water systems due to the occupying power Israeli obstacles, knowing that, on the other hand, 90% of Israelis are enjoying our Palestinian water from the occupied Palestinian West Bank. This high water stress due to excessive Israeli settlers' extraction from the aquifers located in the occupied Palestinian territory. However, Challenges related to obsolete infrastructure, infrastructure assets and the sabotage of the Palestinian water network and rainwater cisterns owned by Palestinian farmers. This sabotage by the Israeli occupation army and Israeli settlers, especially in area C, which is completely under the full control of the Israeli army. Adding to that, the excessive levels of, wa of water consumption by the illegal Israeli settlements built within the occupied Palestinian territory. You can see that we are facing Israeli occupation obstacles to achieve this SDG 6. Another point that we should include in our reports in the, is the financial costs associated with accessing to water, which is particularly devastating for those communities reliant upon livestock herding. For such herder communities, lack of access to water undermines their ability to maintain their level hold, sustainably, sustainably increasing the risk of forcible transfer. Access to water is a human right. A half positive point, we have normally the Israeli-Palestinian Joint Water Committee established during the starting of the peace process and using high technology system and innovative practices to control water distribution equity and enhance water management in the region. But unfortunately, the solutions are not working correctly in the occupied Palestinian territory. And Sorry, we, the Palestinians, still buying conclude? our...
that this water is ex extracted from our aquifer located within our OPT. Thank you, IT. I almost finished. But unfortunately, this solution are not working correctly in the occupied Palestinian territory, and we, the Palestinians, still buying our own water from the occupying power, Israel, recording that this water is extracted from the, our aquifer located within our occupied Palestinian territory in the West Bank and the Jordan Valley Basin. At the end, water is life, and everybody agree with that. So we should look to the political will of government to get a strong action to allow a fair, just, equitable access to water for all. Here, access to technology and science and technology transfer is a must for water management and assuring the involvement of all parties to address the challenges mentioned above. We look forward to continue working and collaboration with all parties to improve our water management system and building capacities and strengthen the international technical ass assistance. Finally, we would like to include Palestine remarks and comments to the CSTD documents and the chair summary report. I thank you. Thank you, Palestine. Uh, now I give the floor to Yemen. Uh, may I ask you to keep to three, five minutes maximum? Thank you so much. Yemen. Merci, Madame la Présidente, et aux intervenants pour leur présentation à la fois riche et intéressante. Euh, l'eau, c'est la vie. Et l'accès à l'eau potable et à l'assainissement, ça devient un défi majeur pour beaucoup de pays, y compris le Yémen, qui traverse une crise aiguë à ce niveau pour des raisons diverses, euh, telles que la guerre qui a impacté les infrastructures déjà obsolètes, L'augmentation de la population et le manque de, de sources, de nouvelles sources d'eau, et également les effets euh, du changement climatique, etc. Les grandes villes au Yémen, comme les collectivités rurales, n'ont plus d'accès à domicile à une eau portable euh, gérée de manière sûre. Alors, les conséquences sont lourdes euh, à tous les niveaux pour euh, réaliser les objectifs de développement durable et surtout sur l'éducation euh, des enfants garçons compis qui passent leur journée à porter des bidons pour transporter de l'eau. Euh, le Yémen a plus de 2600 km euh, de côte maritime et ensoleillé toute l'année. Et espérons dans l'avenir pouvoir profiter euh, de progrès technologiques et convertir l'eau salée en eau potable via l'énergie solaire. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Uh, thank you so much, Yemen. So now I will give the floor to Cuba. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Permítame en primer lugar agradecer al señor González por la presentación del informe del secretario general y a los panelistas por sus muy interesantes intervenciones. Eh, Cuba tiene un firme compromiso con el desarrollo sostenible e inclusivo y para ello eh, intenta movilizar las palancas del conocimiento, la ciencia, la tecnología y la innovación. En los dos últimos años, en el país se ha implementado un sistema de gestión de gobierno basado en ciencia e innovación, que implica que el gobierno a todos los niveles, en interacción con los restantes actores sociales, debe asegurar que la ciencia y la innovación cumplan las funciones sociales que el país necesita. Para la materialización de este objetivo, Cuba ha incluido en su Plan Nacional de Desarrollo Económico y Social hasta el 2030 varios ejes y sectores estratégicos y uno de estos es la ciencia, la tecnología y la innovación. Asimismo, como parte de nuestro Plan de Desarrollo Económico y Social, en correspondencia con la Agenda 2030 y los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, el país implementa una política nacional del agua y el Plan Hidráulico Nacional que incluye cinco proyectos gestionados con 20 indicadores principales que incluyen todos los indicadores de los, del ODS-6. Asimismo, la Constitución cubana reconoce el derecho del acceso al agua y al saneamiento para todos, sustentado en políticas públicas y en la Ley de las Aguas Terrestres, que ordena su gestión integrada y sostenible como un asunto estratégico para el país. 
A pesar del bloqueo impuesto a mi país por más de 60 años, en el periodo 2018-2021, se ha trabajado por garantizar los resultados positivos en el uso eficiente y productivo del agua y se han ejecutado importantes inversiones en la infraestructura, se ha incrementado en más de 85.000 las personas conectadas a las redes de acueducto y ha aumentado considerablemente el número de personas conectadas a las redes y alcantarillado. Tras eh, las intervenciones eh, que hemos escuchado en el día de hoy, señora presidenta, mi delegación, quisiera recordar que recientemente en el, el, la recién finalizada conferencia del agua nuestro país como presidente del G77 hizo un llamado a un mayor financiamiento y transferencia de energía, creación de capacidades para los países del sur. Y este es un tema que traigo a colación porque me parece que en este debate falta también es decir, estamos oyendo iniciativas innovadoras, pero cómo los países en desarrollo tenemos acceso es decir, a esas iniciativas. Creo que este debate también te, de, debería venir con un eh, planteo del de acceso a los financiamientos, cómo acceder a las tecnologías, cómo hacer sostenible estas iniciativas eh, que, se, que se proponen en este, se han planteado en este, en este panel. Entonces, ese yo creo que es mi pregunta hacia los panelistas. Eh, cómo, cómo poder hacer que los países en desarrollo tengamos acceso a las tecnologías, pero además cómo esas tecnologías pueden ser sostenibles y respondan a las necesidades de los países en desarrollo. Eh, recuerdo que la, 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 la señora Buendía hablaba de que eh, la, las innovaciones tenían que reflejar las necesidades de la localidad y evidentemente el Internet de las Cosas no puede estar en una aldea en África porque no va a funcionar y esos son los retos que tenemos los países en desarrollo y es la pregunta que quisiera eh, plantearle a los panelistas. Uh, thank you, Cuba. Uh, at the end, I will give the floor to the panelists to react to all the remarks that were put forward here today. And now I'll give the floor to Paraguay. Por darme la palabra. En representación de la delegación de Paraguay, que tenemos el privilegio de ser miembro de la Comisión de Ciencia y Tecnología para el Desarrollo hasta el 2024, deseo exp expresar nuestro más sincero agradecimiento por propiciar este espacio para el intercambio de experiencias y aprendizaje mutuo, compartido con la comunidad internacional, científica y los representantes gubernamentales aquí presentes. Los intereses específicos del país de la Comisión están contenidos en su Plan Nacional de Desarrollo 2020, en el que el aprovechamiento de la ciencia y la tecnología desempeña un papel crucial para abordar sus retos económicos, sociales y medioambientales, como la mejora de la atención sanitaria y la gestión de los recursos naturales. El acceso universal al agua potable es un eje estratégico en la visión de desarrollo nacional hasta el 2020-30, transversal a los tres pilares del desarrollo. Nos congratulamos de que los temas centrales de debate de esta decimosexta sesión coincidan con el tema acordado por los Estados miembros para el próximo foro político de alto nivel sobre desarrollo sostenible. Esto es tanto más importante cuanto que se debatirá en profundidad el ODS-6 y su nivel de aplicación a nivel mundial, y servirá de preludio a la cumbre ODS-2023. En Paraguay, respecto a la gobernanza del agua, el Servicio Nacional de Agua y Saneamiento, en conjunto con las municipalidades, han dado lugar a las juntas de saneamiento, constituidas por vecinos que sean usuarios o beneficiarios de obras, con la finalidad de obtener la participación comunitaria en la elaboración y ejecución de los programas locales de saneamiento. Desde el punto de vista de género, se ha fomentado la participación de las mujeres en las juntas de saneamiento y su acceso a puestos de liderazgo, como en el proyecto Yo Decido, donde a partir de la trascendental opinión femenina, se cambió el modelo de construcción de las unidades sanitarias básicas, logrando que sean ubicadas cerca de las casas para que sean de fácil acceso para toda la familia, ya que anteriormente contaban con letrinas que se encontraban a unos 50 metros de distancia de la vivienda, lo que condicionaba de forma restrictiva la vida de las mujeres, niños y ancianos al afectar su salud e higiene. Respecto al ODS-6, Paraguay, Paraguay socializó en diciembre de 2022 el Plan Nacional de Gestión de los Recursos Hídricos a cargo del Ministerio del Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible, que busca la eficiencia a fin de emplear los recursos hídricos de la mejor manera posible, la equidad mediante una distribución de la que disfruten todos los grupos sociales y económicos y la sostenibilidad ambiental para proteger la base de los recursos hídricos y los ecosistemas asociados. A nivel regional, valoramos los esfuerzos implementados en el ámbito de la cooperación, puesto que países en condiciones similares hacemos frente a desafíos comunes, como es el caso de la cuenca del río Pilcomayo, parte de la cuenca del río Plata, que a través de la Comisión Trinacional para el Desarrollo de la Cuenca del Río Pilcomayo, en conjunto con la Argentina y Bolivia, 
se busca hacer frente a retos eh, tanto en épocas de riadas como en época de sequías para que las comunidades ribereñas puedan tener acceso al agua de forma segura y regular. En línea con el último punto dado por la adversidad de los extremos climáticos, la prestación del servicio de agua potable desde fuentes superficiales, que representa el 18% a nivel nacional, puede verse comprometida por el cambio en los patrones de precipitación y caudales proyectados, lo que puede afectar a las principales ciudades del país donde existe una alta concentración de personas. Este Plan Nacional de Adaptación al Cambio Climático reconoce los cambios en el ciclo hidrológico, inciden en la calidad y cantidad de agua disponible, con implicaciones para la agricultura, ganadería, abastecimiento para consumo humano, producción hidroeléctrica y los ecosistemas. El Paraguay es uno de los países con mayor cantidad de agua dulce por habitante en el mundo. Sin embargo, hay necesidades de tecnología sobre sistemas de monitoreo y contabilidad en comunidades vulnerables como las rurales e indígenas, donde el SENASA implementa acciones para la construcción de sistemas de abastecimiento de agua con tecnología apropiadas como la macrocaptación de agua de lluvia y gracias al apoyo, el, al apoyo a instituciones financieras e internacionales y países socios para el desarrollo, a quienes alentamos a seguir cooperando. El Paraguay continuará contribuyendo a los esfuerzos de la comunidad internacional para garantizar agua potable y saneamiento para todos, invirtiendo en infraestructuras, promoviendo la educación, colaborando con organizaciones internacionales, apoyando la investigación y la innovación y abordando el cambio climático conforme a los planes estratégicos nacionales. Finalmente, hacemos un llamado a la comunidad inter internacional para la asistencia a partir de la ventaja comparativa que gozan los países con mayor experiencia para fortalecer las políticas públicas, los marcos regulatorios y las finanzas a todos los niveles para el aprovechamiento del potencial científico y tecnológico. El cierre de las brechas tecnológicas y el aumento de la creación de capacidad a todos los niveles contribuirá, en esencia, para lograr el cambio hacia el desarrollo sostenible y poder avanzar, pero sin dejar a nadie atrás, en el cumplimiento del ODS-6 respecto al acceso universal y equitativo al agua potable y a los servicios de saneamiento e higiene adecuado para todos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Paraguay. So, our final uh, speaker for today's general discussion, China, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the floor. The United Nations has just held its second water conference in 50 years. The international community attaches great importance to address water-related issues and has realized the importance of water sanitation to achieving good health and well-being, gender equality, food security, sustainable development, and eradicating poverty. China has a large population base, and due to the influence of topography and precipitation, the distribution of water resources is uneven from north to south. A series of national projects have been carried out to ensure water use. Over the years, China has explored the use of scientific and technological means to help everyone enjoy safe drinking water and sanitation facilities, carried out rainwater harvesting projects in arid areas, developed water-saving irrigation technologies to save water resources, used remote sensing and other technologies to observe uh, hydrological conditions, and cooperated with international organizations for training workshops on young science officials from developing countries, and shared useful experience and technological achievements with other developing countries. In recent years, the use of digital technology was applied to remotely monitor water pollution, control pollutants drainage, improve water sanitation facilities, and improve people's safety and happiness index. China is willing to work closely with the Commission and share more relevant knowledge to the international community for realizing the SDG 6 on safe water and sanitation for all through STI solutions. Thanks, Madam Chair, for the floor, and I'll yield the floor. Uh, thank you, China. Uh, you, you were the final speaker uh, in the room. We still have two. Uh, speakers uh, in um, in the remote mode. So now I will ask Mr. Uh, Tushikazu Tokioka, uh, Director for International Coordination, River Engineering, International Affairs Office, River Planning Division uh, from the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism from Japan. Please, sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, can, can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. Yeah, uh, thank you, 
uh, for giving the floor. So uh, from Japan, I'd like to, to introduce some of the, the Japan's contribution to, uh, to water, uh, referring the, uh, the one uh, historical event, which is the UN Water uh, Conference uh, held in uh, New York. So last week, uh, from 22 to 24 March, uh, the UN Water Conference uh, 2023 was held in New York with the presence of uh, many head of states, minister, vice minister, and secretary general from uh, approximately 200 member states and uh, UN agencies and other stakeholders. And Japan also uh, dispatched is a high level uh, government official to, to the uh, UN Motor Conference. And uh, the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the Republic of Tajikistan served uh, co-chair of the conference. And uh, the main theme of the conference uh, was discussed in the five interactive uh, dialogue as health and uh, development and water for climate and resilience and water for cooperation and water uh, action, uh, sorry, uh, water action agenda. And uh, Japan had served a co-chair of interactive dialogue three, uh, climate and resilience uh, together with uh, Egypt. And uh, during the uh, UN Water Conference, uh, totally more than 300 US, uh, 300 billion US dollars uh, commitment to contribute to the global water challenges have been pledged during the conference. And Japan also contributed with 3.8 billion US dollars to the commitment through the, uh, the Japanese government uh, initiative or Kumamoto initiative for water. And uh, our Japan's Kumamoto initiative for water is emphasizing the, uh, promoting hybrid solution contributing to uh, both climate mitigation and adaptation measures and enhancing, the, uh, yeah, encouraging the water related risk evaluation by using advanced satellite observation data and also contributing uh, conventional uh, cooperation project of water supply and wastewater treatment project in various countries. And I look forward to working with uh, many partners to contribute to the global water challenge by using uh, this uh, Kumamoto initiative for water. Thank you very much for giving that role. Thank you very much, uh, Japan. Now I'll give the floor to uh, Mr. Misa Bay. Uh, from the VH Group India. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the floor. Thanks to Mr. Gonzalez for the report, and thanks to all the panelists who presented today. Most importantly, to Professor Cabrera for an eye opening presentation. Madam Chair, from past half decade, we have seen boom in usage of artificial intelligence, machine learning virtual reality, which demands for an ethical consideration, key policies and regulatory frameworks to be in place to ensure safe water and sanitation for all, more particularly to vulnerable populations such as women, children, refugees, and people with disabilities. I hope this consideration is taken well and is propagated as such that it is to be taken on priority. Thanks to all. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, now I will give the floor to Thailand, who would, would like to react to uh, some of the remarks that were made here today. Thailand. I would like to invite uh, our director from TSI Research Institute to give some uh, comments on the collaboration among members, please. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the president of Thailand Science Research and Innovation. Uh, may I respond to the question about uh, collaboration between uh, Thailand and other member countries? Actually, we have not yet been the member of uh, 
is the STD. But anyway, we are happy to to share with you and Thailand would like to open for trainings and share our experiences to those who are interested in our model. Actually, we have uh, a lot more models that we are doing a kind of uh, research and innovation in the local level. And secondly, we hope to learn from those who have experience and have good management system about the drought and water pollution management. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thailand, uh, for uh, your kind offer. Um, now, uh, do we have any other remote speaker? No, we do not. Um, so uh, I don't know if uh, any other country would like to to speak now on this uh, very important theme. So if it is not the case, I'm. Sorry. Perhaps we have a remote speaker. I'm trying to understand. So, so yes, we have um, another speaker uh, remotely. So uh, it is uh, Mr. Dennis Norton, a chairperson of Interparliamentary Union uh, from the Working Group on Science and Technology. Please, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairperson, and thank you for the, the presentations this morning. Uh, I'm a member of the Irish Parliament and uh, a former Cabinet Minister in Ireland. I'm addressing you as the Chairperson of the Interparliamentary Union Working Group on Science and Technology. Our Working Group is a co-sponsor of the Interparliamentary Union at CERN Science for Peace Schools. Uh, which is intended to bridge the worlds of science and politics uh, by initiating dialogue and helping create a community of parliamentary experts to address challenges together under the neutral umbrella of science. The inaugural theme of, of our peace school was dealing with water scarcity, an opportunity to rebuild peace uh, with science. Focusing on water management, and the exploration of new and renewable water sources, the school aimed to contribute to the positive technical cooperation and environment for negotiations by proposing alternative technologies and modalities to lessen the tensions related to water scarcity, thus encouraging coexistence between nations. Notably, participants agreed on the importance of implementing two regional projects on water in the Sahel region and in Palestine. This will culminate in a follow-up conference for parliamentarians and scientists uh, from across the globe, focusing on water and food security from the 19th to the 24th of June uh, next at the uh, International Centre for Interdisciplinary Plenary Science and Education in Kainan in, in Vietnam. As we all know to be a successful scientist, uh, it is essential to have vision, commitment, and tolerance, despite disagreements. These are three fundamental aspects to the initiation, realization, and success of scientific experiments to serve humanity. And this is also the case for successful politicians. We both have the same goal to use our skills to solve problems and improve people's lives. And there is no greater goal than Sustainable Development Goal 6 to provide water and sanitation for all. But to achieve this, we need to ensure that both the parliamentary and scientific communities change the language they communicate so that they can engage directly with each other and use empirical evidence to inform policy making. 
it's also essential uh, that science is accessible to all countries. And this can only be achieved through the facilitation of international cooperation to eliminate the risk of parochialism or duplication. Water is the perfect pathfinder project to achieve this goal. The clear evidence shows us that countries that engage in bilateral and multilateral agreements tend to be more peaceful as these agreements create a more favorable condition for direct investment in projects such as water. The reality is that research communities depend on the support, uh, on supportive policies and funding that are decided upon through the financial and legal frameworks for research discussions. Um, MPs are vital in the decisions that are made regarding the finances and those legal frameworks, particularly when it comes to multi-generational delivery on such, such objects, objectives. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Now I have another remote uh, speaker, uh, Marziet Asude from Iran. Please. Hello, good morning. I'm a physicist. I work on quantum technologies. I'd like to emphasize the role of quantum technologies in overcoming the challenges like water problem, COVID-19, climate change, and other disaster, disasters like earthquake, floods, storms, and many other complicated problems. Actually, these technologies are promising in investigation on these problems, especially quantum sensors and quantum computers. The precise measurement of radiation of magnetic field and perhaps other geological factors and sensing the source of underground water. Therefore, investing in these new technologies may help us and other developing countries in overcoming many complicated challenges. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Uh, th thank you so much, Madam. So now I think that we don't have any other remote participant. Is that so? Nope. Okay. So now I will. I I will. Uh, um, would like to to give the floor back to our panelists. Uh, if they would like to comment, uh, to say anything about these uh, very rich remarks that we had here today after their presentations. So I wonder if, uh, yes, so please, uh, Mrs. Um, Wendy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, first, I think we're all in agreement that water is very important. Second, I'd like to encourage everyone that since this is important in all our countries, let us leverage on what we have existing in our countries, even if it's technology, if it's human resources, or if it's um, finances, leverage it to partner with others. And third, let us use uh, uh, several of the platforms that are available to us in order that we can um, collaborate with each other. I think it's high time that we do partnership rather than working in silos or do partnership rather than having it as a donor and donor relationship. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much. I wonder if, if Professor Cabrera. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps I would like to address uh, the concerns on, on how to make um, knowledge and technologies available. In, in developing countries. And I think that that is a very important issue that was raised by Cuba. I think that it, um, open access, it's important in science. I think that having open access in both journals and books is is very important at the moment. And and I think there's there's a, quite a movement around the world on that. And, and I just would like to say that, you know, in IWA, we're very much in favor of trying to put as much open content out there as possible. Some of the tools I presented, they are open as well, so they can be used free of charge and they're available online and they can be used. 
I, I would say that also uh, online training and open online training, it's also a very good tool that was discussed yesterday. So uh, the existence of massive online open courses and, and other online courses, it's, I think, uh, very important as well. And and I would like to say also that the network of professionals is also important. So it's not all about just content, meeting people, having people get together and discuss uh, the problems is important. And to that respect, I think it's important uh, that, that um, events and 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 uh, gatherings like this one or professional gatherings also important to to disseminate that knowledge. Muitas gracias, uh, Professor Kuntana Kulvog. You would like to have the floor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, lastly, I think uh, thanks for the organizer, and then I think uh, technology is the first start to uh, implement. However, uh, when our research, I think there are vertical axis and horizontal axis. Huh? So in horizontal axis, uh, we need some agreement among the committee and some, but uh, the vertical axis, how to expand. Uh, we meet with a very uh, government regulation, which uh, normally the uh, government has uh, very fragmented agencies. And we try to combine SCI to link the, the data and also information to link and you know together. And this is what we issue that uh, we have to reform the legal aspect so that uh, the, the user and the policy and the information can flow uh, better. So that is uh, something that we also we want to learn from other countries, how to transform this uh, governance, including uh, legal aspect in terms of the SCI base in WRM in the next decade. That is uh, my uh, comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. So after this session, I hope you can teach me how to say your name correctly, at least after I, I don't know how to, how to pronounce it. So uh, if uh, there are no other interventions, I wish to thank uh, our panelists here today, our panelists that intervened remotely, our discussant, and uh, all the speakers from the different countries for their participation and for their contributions uh, to the rich discussion uh, we have had. Now we have to act. So uh, very good uh, commitments, very good solutions, but now it's time to act. This afternoon, the CSTD session will uh, resume at 3 p.m. We will have up the priority theme on technology and innovation for a cleaner and more productive and competitive production. Prior to that, and uh, as indicated in the program, there will be a lunchtime hybrid side event on the application of satellite technology to support inclusive implementation of the sustainable development goals. You can either attend this event in person in this room or join uh, the event remotely through the Zoom link. There are some sandwich outside this room, but they are only for the ones that will stay for this session. <laughs> Thank you, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>